Okay, so thank you to Candice, Rohitten, Alejandro, Najira for that, that excellent conversation. Um, our next and final panel is titled Climate Change and Financing a Just Transition. Uh, our moderator is Planetary Politics Director Hila Rasul Ayoub. Uh, Hila runs at Planetary Politics a body of work we call Power Reimagined, uh, which focuses on uh, decarbonization and financing a just energy transition um, around the world. Um, Gila was previously a foreign service officer with USAID, uh, where she had extensive experience working with multilateral institutions. Uh, she held positions such as the Director of Global Engagement on the National Security Council for a while, uh, and she was a director of the Office of Development Coordination at USAID. Uh, she is a lawyer by training, um, and she worked also as an investigator with the World Bank's Integrity Vice Presidency, going after corruption and bad actors in the World Bank system. Uh, so, without further ado, I will turn it over to Gila. Thanks, Gordon, and welcome, everybody. We are so glad to have you join us for this all-important conversation um, and discussion on the planetary climate crisis and the need to center historically marginalized frontline communities in climate policy and financing discussions. Like no other time in recent history have those of us in the global north and wealthier nations faced the ravages of the climate crisis in the way that we did this summer, the hottest summer recorded in history. But frontline communities, those communities that have been facing the impacts of the climate crisis, be it through devastating floods, hurricanes, droughts, they've been telling us for a long time that while they are on the front lines right now, the crisis will come to us all. So as such, the discussions and policies that are drawn up need to center those voices and experiences to come up with solutions that will benefit the planet as a whole. So it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our incredibly illustrious panelists today. Um, next to me, we have uh, Dr. Saeed Muhammad Ali, who is a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute, lecturer at the Advanced Academic Programs at Johns Hopkins. He has also ha done consult uh, extensive consulting work with the United Nations, CARE International, among other international bodies. Um, he is a, a regular contributor to the Express Tribune, an affiliate of the New York Times in Pakistan. He has taught international affairs, international development, and anthropology courses in Australia, Pakistan, and the United States. So welcome, Dr. Ali. And then we have um, Heather McTeer Tony. I'm very glad to introduce her. She is the executive director of the Beyond Petroleum Chemicals campaign. She is also the author of the book Before the Streetlights Come On, Black America's Urgent Call for Climate Solutions. Uh, she um, was also appointed by President Barack Obama uh, within the EPA and has previously served as mayor to Green, uh, at Greenville, Mississippi, um, one of the youngest mayors at 27. Um, and I just learned in the green room, they have a sister city in Liberia. And so um, that's always wonderful to see. And then on the screen here, um, we are very glad to have join us uh, Camila Camillo. Camila is a, an activist out of Brazil. She's a social entrepreneur building bridges between large organizations and grassroots initiatives to develop open innovation projects social responsibility strategies within the ESG agenda, and initiative focused on climate action. After five years of engagement with communities in the Amazon rainforest as a volunteer on social projects, she founded the Creators Academy Brazil, a community of content creators who amplify the agenda of protecting Brazilian biomes. She is also a contributor um, to the Agarape Institute, a think tank focused on public and digital security and climate governance. Also to the Angels of the City Association, which has been working with the homeless population, addiction issues, and restorative uh, justice for 35 years. So um, with that, um, I would like to quickly just jump into some questions. I've learned a lot from my boss in terms of going off script, so I hope that you all will join me for that ride. 
So we'll begin this discussion with a little bit of scene setting to understand both the depth and the history of the climate crisis for these frontline communities. And then we can move to some pathways for solutions and hopefully uh, identify some glimmers of hope. So I'll first turn to you, Heather. Um, in your book, Before the Street Lights Come On, you draw a clear line between the racist redlining policies, which continue to endure to this day, and African Americans' increased vulnerability to climate change and climate disasters. From your work, what are the most pressing climate-related challenges faced by frontline communities in the US, and how do those challenges intersect with issues of social justice and economic justice? Well, thank you so much for that question, and thank you all for being here. It's certainly an honor, and I'm, I'm excited that we're having this conversation in a moment that's so critical to both uh, how we think about climate solutions in the future and, and, more importantly, how we engage people to be a part of that, because the conversation around just transition can't begin until we recognize that we have an unjust system. And that unjust system is what has put us in a position where we have communities, particularly communities of color and African American communities in the Southeast, Southeast that have always existed in a space of being detrimentally, detrimentally and disproportionately impacted by climate and by um, large oil and gas and petrochemical facilities that have put themselves on the very footprint of plantations and of the enslaved system of the Southeast. So when you ask the question of what are these biggest challenges, they're all intersectional because we cannot silo these impacts to our communities. Uh, environmental health and the health impacts of people who live under a cloud of pollution, quite literally, uh, are also a, a, a cumulative impact because just as we are experiencing the uh, health impacts of having distressed lungs, of seeing our children who have more impacts of asthma uh, and have more experiences of these, um, these very real and present health issues, they also overlap with education. Mm -hmm. They also overlap with the ability to sustain infrastructure in our communities. They also overlap with the economic development ability in a community. So the same experience of someone who is from Greenville, Mississippi, or from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or um, from Texas, uh, who is not able to go to work because they've got um, kids at home that have had to go to the hospital because they've got an asthma attack. Uh, we all know sick people can't work. And so if you're at home and you've got sick days, and all of these things, again, are uh, continuing to bundle together there's no reason for us to think that if we continue along that same strain, that we can have a just transition to clean energy without addressing these injustices in the past. And, and I'm really excited to think about what those solutions can be and how we do that together. Well, and we talked about this a little bit just now, but you know, there's the work that you're doing here in the US, but there are also opportunities to tie that to work that is being done globally, especially in the global south. So if you could share some of your experiences in trying to do that and where you see those opportunities bubbling up. There have always been connections between people across geopolitical borders. We've never been limited by what our governments are doing. Uh, I was sharing with you when I was mayor of Greenville, Mississippi, our sister city was Greenville County uh, in Liberia. And it was such an honor to know the history that people had between our communities. This little town in the Mississippi Delta that had uh, connections overseas. But that continues to this day. At Beyond Petrochemicals, we're very proud that we get to support frontline communities as they present themselves in the Global Plastics Treaty. So we'll be going and supporting them in Nairobi, Kenya when they travel in November and watching how these frontline communities, Fence Line Watch in um, Houston, Texas, Yvette Ariano, or the Descendants Project in St. Uh, St. Paul the Baptist Parish uh, in Louisiana, uh, Dr. Joy and Joe Banner, watching how they are able to, on an international stage, have deep conversation and share the stories and their real lived experience of what it means to live right underneath of these facilities, it bears such resemblance to the exact same experience of people who are living in other countries. 
And it's those stories that is really moving how our governments are deciding where and what we're going to do to reduce plastics uh, globally, uh, how plastic pollution should be addressed, and then what are the steps to ensure economic viability of our communities globally moving forward. It's the people's story that, that's moving this action. And I think that's when we put that emphasis and put economic development along with that, we really begin to see significant change for our future. Thank you. I mean, and you know, this leads me to kind of your background in this work, and especially in Pakistan, Dr. Ali. You know, looking at global discourse on these topics, there have been conversations on how the transition to renewable energy has the potential for and is already leaving behind those in low-income or emerging economies in particular, that these countries don't have adequate access to financing needed for the transition, and that even so, the shift to renewables could be detrimental to their human and economic development needs. But how do those who are in the seats of power take in that discourse? Is it being taken in? And if not, what opportunities are there for these communities to insert themselves? Well, I think that discourse is, uh, I, I do agree that, I mean, they're are, we live in a world with unjust systems, and uh, I, I think those discourses are not only uh, not being, you know, uh, dealt with adequately within the global south, but they are, um, you know, I mean, those discourses also generate uh, largely from the global north as well. And, uh, you know, I mean, there is something about these, like, asymmetrical, I mean, I, I know we've discussed uh, um, the idea of international financial institutions earlier, but, you know, there is something about the market mechanism when it intersects with power, for instance, right, or, or, or deprivation. And it creates these asymmetries, right, which, which are not, uh, you know, which are not unique, which are not um, uh, rare. I mean, they, they happen frequently. I mean, they happen even in the global north if one looks at the inequities. I mean, uh, on, on paper, this may be the land of opportunity, but we know that social mobility and because of historical reasons and, and so many other factors um, uh, that, that we don't see a level playing field. And similarly, I think in, in those parts of the world as well, uh, you know, there are, so in Sindh, for instance, uh, with this whole idea of like carbon trading, there's, there's uh, you know, there's the idea of, uh, of um, investing in the mangroves, mm -hmm. which seems like a, a great idea, but you know, that investment, um, when it's done in this, um, you know, in this exclusionary sense, uh, denies local uh, indigenous communities, fisher folk, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, access to mangroves because they are, they are initially sam uh, saplings, uh, you know, and, and they have to be looked after. So it creates, you know, uh, further exclusion and then alongside that exclusion, I mean, you have trawlers now uh, deep, deep, deep sea fishing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you know, often in, in the, the, the solutions that one sees unfolding on the ground, there seems to be two steps forward, but also certainly one step back. Yeah, for, uh, uh, sure, and I know that, you know, I have discussed, you know, the new resource curse that is, uh, you know, being faced, especially in the move to renewables. So how do you see communities responding to this new resource uh, curse, especially those marginalized communities in, in the global south? I think there's some level of agitation, but, you know, even in, in, in the politics, I mean, for Pakistan, for instance, I mean, the last prime minister uh, sort of, you know, uh, jumped on, on, on the bandwagon and, and rightly so of trying to do forestation. Big, you know, the, the, the tree tsunami, he called it. And he got international attention as well. But that is also then happening alongside these urban industrial projects which are quite detrimental. So trying to build uh, a new, uh, you know, create this new riverfront on the Ravi River in, in the city of Lahore for instance, like this huge mega uh, project was quite problematic for a, a variety of environmental reasons and the dispossession that it was going to cause for the local communities. So I think that they, 
you know, I mean, one can see some project-based, uh, you know, innovation. One can see people trying to be resilient in the way that people uh, are because, I mean, we have a tendency to cope with the circumstances that, that we find ourselves in. But they don't, you know, I mean, one doesn't see enough leverage being uh, exercised to be able to kind of push back on these ideas. So, you know, and, and as a consequence, we, we've seen uh, food hikes uh, uh, co, you know, coexist and in fact being encouraged by things like, you know, the move towards biofuels. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, with, with cobalt, uh, what, what's happening with the mining of uh, cobalt in the DRC. Uh, we see now in Guyana, like Exxon moving in, and then Guyana, because there's such a financial crunch, has to, you know, is thinking of that as an opportunity to invest in resilience. I mean, we saw in the COPs, uh, you know, how uh, there's all this emphasis on curbing emission, not emphasis on uh, enough emphasis on mitigation, right. uh, on loss and damage. I mean that that it's come out as a nice term, but one hasn't uh, seen uh, you know much action on it uh, thus far. And uh, with with the new COP and where it's going to be, I mean one one wonders. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'd love to dig into that a little more in a bit, but I, I want to turn to Camila first. Um, Camila, I hope you can hear us um, and yeah. see it, uh, us in the room, but. Um, your work is driven by the recognition that the discussions around global climate policy making process have been very technical and quite, quite frankly, just inaccessible. You have personally walked away from a COP convenings feeling disenchanted, undervalued, and as a young person of color from the global south, do you see meaningful pathways for representation and what is lacking in these spaces? Well, um, yeah, I. I saw, I actually, I was like feeling in my skin during my first call. I was there and I was like, I wasn't understanding the conversation and it wasn't for lack of education, but it wasn't because they chose to talk a language that isn't accessible for people like me. So I decided to ask the dumb questions during the sessions and some of those folks there was like, oh, this is room is not for you. Uh, then I come back home and I think, okay, it, what is lacking is people like me earn a seat on the table because we are taking the streets. I was part of like one or two climate strikes during the call, but when we entered to the conference, I was like out of the conference. Like I was there like observing, but without any right to really participate and be heard. And I think like what we can do, especially uh, global North countries that are really committed with to a just transition is create more social participation um, raise collective ambitions, like people on the ground, they are experiencing, and we have like a ton of methodologies to hear their experiences and stories and what they need. And also we have already the tools to measure how much money we need to address the solution. I've been heard a lot of discussions around mitigation, but now we need to face what is happening. Like, we need to adapt. And like the global South countries, the developing economies, I felt that we are, we had like this willing to contribute, but we need to, to be invited for the decision-making tables. Um, I think many of initiatives led by youth, they, they are good to mobilize the society around the issues, but they still are not providing too much solutions because we don't have the opportunity to work on the solutions together. 
Uh, so I think it's our, it's our rule now, create these spaces when, where like people, like youth driven projects or um, grassroots initiatives can be part of uh, the, the, like the big picture plan, you know? Yeah. Uh, thanks for that, Camila. And that begs the question, you know, will you be going to the next cup? E okay, uh, <laughs> probably. I'm working on it. Um, but but I, I'm confused about the next cup a little bit, especially in, well after everything that is happening now. It's probably more that this cup we will address different topics than the like phasing out of fossil fuels. Or uh, we probably will talk more about food systems, which is important as well. But uh, we, but some of the issues that we need to address now, because we are far away from the 2030 um, metrics and, and goals. So like if we're not discussing phasing out fossil fuels and just transition, from the ground, like, okay, we can go to renewable, but like how the communities feel uh, when the equipment get there, how their houses are like now. So yeah, like I think this COP is an opportunity for the global community to step up for a very serious conversation and get out of the, probably um, corporate interest. Like we are not against people getting results. The first people need to be alive to get results after. There's certainly a lot of truth in that. Um, slightly shifting gears in a little bit. I know we laid the landscape a little bit in terms of like the direness of the situation. But as I was reading your book, Heather, um, I enjoyed it thoroughly. It was very, it was funny. <laughs> it was practical. Um, and it's always wonderful having things uh, to read that give, outline some concrete solutions. Um, you know, your book laid to bear some of the racist policies that were put into place that marginalized black and brown communities in the US but it offered solutions for the communities themselves, but for policymakers as well. Because I think, you know, so often we see the onus pushed on communities entirely. But one thing that you do know in your book is that when it comes to climate and environmental issues, while humanity is in the same store, we're not all on the same types of boats. Yes. Some are on yachts, some are not. That's right. So how do we get, maybe if not on a yacht, but Maybe a catamaran. Ah, that, uh, it's, I don't think we're ever going to get to a place, let me be clear, that everybody is in the same type of situation because that's just our reality on this planet. And the analysis that I, the, I think the analogy that I make is yes, we always, you hear this, we're all in the same storm together, we should row together. And I don't think that's quite true. We're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same kind of boat. And there are very privileged people in our world that are sailing on big, huge mega yachts, and they're able to weather a storm, while some of us are in little rafts and inflatables and, and little rowboats that are leaking. And when you think about that analogy, there is something we could do collectively, though, as we're in this storm together, if we have a sense of altruism, if we're really concerned about our fellow man and want to make it and survive. Um, it, it, it makes a difference if there are any people who are uh, water people uh, and, and have this experience. It makes a difference when you have a, a big boat that's able to block the wave for that smaller boat uh, and so that they're not feeling the impact because that big boat can take on that impact in a way that would toss those smaller boats. And that's what I think we have to think about when, we, when we're talking about solutions from the perspective of our policymakers and our communities and really get into the realistic elements of what will it take to really stop and protect people from this crisis. And my role at Beyond Petrochemicals, it's, it's, it's very plain. We're looking to stop the expansion of over 120 petrochemical facilities in the United States of America. 
And when you ask yourself, well, what, why? What's a petrochemical? Petrochemical is just oil. So we're in this conference talking about what is a just transition. It's not a just transition to more oil. It should be a just transition to get out of oil and gas. Yet we have an industry that is beginning to tell people and convince them that you need more petrochemicals. You need more of plastic in order to survive the climate crisis. That's, again, just like the big yacht and the big mega boats telling the people in the small little tugboats, we're going to help you if we go way over here off to the side. That's not reality. Well, and it's, it's, it's definitely not going to help us to solve a climate crisis. And just one more point, if you think about this too, um, with, with petrochemicals and, and really how we're thinking about reducing carbon emissions um, throughout all of these industries. Petrochemicals are responsible for roughly 10% of carbon emissions now, and that's growing. So if you have an oil and gas industry that knows they're going to have to come out of what they're doing right now and go into something else, it is also a natural assessment to understand what that will mean for the emissions and as a result, what that continues to do for, to our climate crisis. And we can talk about you know, a little bit later how and what the solutions are, particularly for communities of color. But I think it's important for us to set the stage and understand what these impacts are and how we're all feeling them. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's an important point. This is a question for all of the panelists, actually, is the communications and the PR piece. I think research is showing now that um, the fossil fuel industry in recent years has made a strategic shift away from just outright climate denial and is, you know, to more nuanced messaging um, and discourses on climate delay. And so they're using these communities and uh, as we talk about just transition, as we talk about socioeconomic transition, uh, the message that is going to these communities is that y there's no room for you in the renewable space. You're going to be out of jobs. So this climate discourse, it's really just for the elite, but they don't really care about your day to day. How do you see, how do communities kind of, or the people who care about these issues push back on this narrative, especially in light of the money, the sheer power that is behind this discourse? So I don't know who wants to start with that, but Heather, it looks like you've got some thoughts. <laughs> oh, I think to tell the truth, um, we were looking at a Chevron, um, a Chevron ad that came out a few weeks ago promoting CCS, carbon capture sequestration, particularly in the southeast and Louisiana area. And uh, the first image that came up after you see the Chevron logo is a picture of a black woman and she's running and jogging. And it's, it's like she's just happy, carefree, uh, beautiful, gorgeous, dark-skinned woman with AirPods and natural hair and a great outfit. And it just begs the question, what in the world does this have to do with protecting people uh, in communities? Why, wh wh what is this, this connection here? Immediately, personally, I felt it because I think black women are magical. But <laughs> obviously, uh, Chevron, too, thinks that we can use an image that it is resonating and right now is very powerful in so many different spaces to make people feel either comfortable or that they need to take some type of action. And that's not the reality in that particular community. It's certainly not the reality for the people who are living in a space where they are inundated with oil and gas um, facilities, but these are the very same facilities that are not putting the jobs in their communities. There's a great piece that was um, done just this past week. It, it appeared on uh, New Orleans radio, done by Floodlight News, that um, highlighted the fact that with all of the oil and gas industries that are in these areas, the percentage of jobs that go to black and brown and indigenous people just pales in comparison to the percentage to white people who are not even from the same space. So they're giving this message that they're bringing jobs into a community for people that make up 70% of the working population are people of color, yet they have less than, they have 19% of the high paying jobs. People who are, have the jobs, they're bringing from uh, other places. And then these same industries have the audacity to say it's because people are not qualified. So 
make it make sense to me. <laughs> Why are you going to put a, a polluting industry into a place that you say is bringing jobs, but you're at the same time saying that people are not qualified for the job, so you have to bring somebody else in to do it, and the people who are living there are getting sick and are poor and are dying, and all of this is to say you're transitioning to something good. It doesn't make sense. And people who live there know it. Mm -hmm. And I think the more that we're able to tell this message and elevate the voices of people, these are the, the, the folks that are going to a cop mm -hmm. that need to, to be able to share and talk about this message because their experience is the same experience of our friends, our brothers and sisters that are in the global south. And, and while I think the industries often try, time, try to keep us siloed from one another, there is significant power in understanding that we have this shared experience, we need to talk about this shared experience, and then we need to push and advocate for the solutions that will rectify this. And let, let's just call a thing a thing. Mm -hmm. No, and, you know, make sure the math maths. Make sure the math maths. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and a lot of this, and we've seen this, you know, growing up, you need to recycle, turn off your lights. A lot of the conversation and uh, the responsibility has been placed on consumers. Whereas when you, we really look at the numbers, when you look at the emissions overall globally, it, it, it doesn't make a difference. I can have my plastic straws, won't make a difference. How do you see this taking shape in the global south, especially? And I think, you know, with um, India's G20 presidency this last year, India was in particular very much pushing that, uh, you know, that model of responsibility on consumers, and that shifts the attention away from the actual emitters. Absolutely. I mean, an example I like to use in the classroom. I must have heard it somewhere myself as well, is like, you know, the, the conscientious consumer. Mm -hmm. And the conscientious consumer is basically exercising conscientiousness uh, through the wallet. You know, I mean, I, I can be a very nice person, but, uh, you know, uh, if I don't have uh, the luxury of buying, uh, you know, a, a dozen eggs for six dollars, then, then I just have to put up with those caged chicken and, uh, you know, and, and that's the way it is. And I think that this is, it hasn't quite caught on into, uh, you know, consumer markets in the global south where there's, initially there's more brand consciousness. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then more basic issues like food adulteration. Mm -hmm. But even if it, but it does go, it has already penetrated there in other ways. So things like social entrepreneurship. I mean, it would be great if the whole world had social entrepreneurship and we didn't see the kind of exorbitant profit making that we do. And, you know, perhaps this idea of balancing multiple bottom lines at the same time. But the, but the way that uh, big business will endorse, right, uh, throw money at uh, social entrepreneurship, what it's doing is it's, it's making people who are at the bottom of the barrel clean up some of the mess to enable consumerism to exist as it does. So for instance, like things like I'm several, a few years ago, uh, something like the plastic bank you know, got, got attention, and, and they, other models like um, uh, kabariwala.com, et cetera, in India. And, you know, the idea is that you basically, uh, uh, you know, um, using economies of scale with scavengers, essentially, uh, to capture uh, waste plastic before it goes into the ocean, and you monetize them, you know, where they get some, some cash or, um, uh, you know, other kinds of uh, goods for picking up, you know, people's plastic. Right. So, you know, it, it's a way, nice little way of sidestepping this huge plastic problem which is created by these beverage companies. I mean, on, uh, in another way, if you think of co-option, I mean, think of feminism co-opted and seduced by, by these forces. So, you know, just because a woman becomes a uh, chief financial officer for a sugary beverage drink doesn't <laughs> do much for gender empowerment, mm -hmm. right? But it's presented as, as you know, this, this way of changing the world for the better. So I think these are, you know, I mean, these are the kinds of issues that um, are uh, in India now as it's aspiring to become 
the, the factory of the world. I mean, there has been, you know, a lot of research coming out talking about, uh, you know, the, the link between this kind of ultra-nationalist government and big money. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Adanis and, and, and whatnot. And I mean, this is, this is not only unique to India. I mean, here in the US or elsewhere, I mean, it, it's, it's a ploy used by populace where they deflect attention from the, from the stagnation, from the frustration of the ordinary man by pitting him against the other, right? So it's not your frustration as a, uh, as a blue collar worker, either you infuse that with a sense of nationalistic pride or turn it into the, the fault of someone else in some other country or some migrant who's stolen your job. Right, so I, I, I think these are, uh, you know, I mean, and, and unfortunately, I mean, in a, in a town like this as well, we still see finger pointing mm -hmm. often, you know, so I mean, one thinks that, you know, there are enough of these discussions, but, you know, when I go to think tanks and, and, and you know, I, I work with as well, I don't see enough uh, self-reflection, you know, or reflexivity as the anthropologists call it, like your own position. Right. Your positionality. So I, I, I think there's certainly much more room, uh, uh, you know, for that. I mean, b before we get to the positive. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I, if, if, if I may, I think that's it's such an important point that, that you're making because it's also it's 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 normalizing this crisis and normalizing things that in, in effect the industry wants us to normalize so that they can continue to do the the bad things that are happening. So, you know, this idea of, in the United States, having a, um, a, a, a touchy feeling about waste pickers because they're picking up plastics and, and we're saying, well, why don't you just get rid of the, all the plastics and pitting people one against the other? And I think it's, we should all be very careful about that. We should all be extremely careful about normalizing these things. We, we saw um, a report that came out uh, about two weeks ago <laughs> that showed this, a Swedish scientist who had come up as an art installation, this way to turn um, waste plastic into an, a flavored ice cream. Now, y yes, your face is exactly like mine was at the time. <laughs> Seriously, is this what we're doing now? Um, but this, it, it really begged the question of how much and how far are um, people willing to go to normalize some of these issues that are, are detrimental to our health, both physically and humanity, but also as a planet. And so these are the things that I think we have to talk about. Uh, it begs the question, where is the funding that really needs to come to communities to help us to come up with solutions, right? We talk, we talk about the solutions a little bit, uh, but it, we, we have right now venture capitalists the amount of money that venture capitalists have put into minority communities, the black and brown innovators and creators that are coming up with climate solutions. Again, that's a, a, it was 2% of all venture capitalists are funding black and brown inventors. That's a number that can change. That's a space where private equity and private business and dollars and investment can actually go to people who can create in the global south, who can create in the language and spaces that they know and the people and the culture that they know. And I think that's one of the things that we really need to look at in terms of creating shift in solutions. Well, I think that's where uh, I would love can I jump? Yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> Who is trying to come okay. up with that solution? I have like, that side. Yeah, I have like my two cents on that. Um, a few months ago, I was in a room with like over 300, 200 advertisers talking to them about regenerative communication. Um, because, yes, the industry, they have like the bad products or some stuff. But is the advertisement industry? that is responsible for creating the desire for this overconsumption behavior. So if we don't w work on those that understand how the human minds work for the desire of a more sustainable way of living, we will continue um, with this blaming game to the individual's practices like putting in the individual side the responsibility for save the planet, but we need a system, systemic approach 
and this and, and this like invites corporate governments and every and everyone but uh when it comes to message i've been seeing especially here in brazil for example some advertisers taking place of the technicians to decide esg strategies how how is that possible how is this happening now when we have like for example i worked like last year in a project was a um, very special project around like uh, circularity and the company invests a certain like a certain amount of money and five times more on the campaign to tell the consumers what they do. So we know where the money is going. The money is going for campaigning greenwashing. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can go to the venture capital money, but also the companies has these big accounts of marketing to sell their reputation when they could use like part of these resources to uh, improve the community's work and like working on the negative impact they are causing. I think this is one thing. The other side, if we, if we do a better stakeholder map, considering the I, ICLP, um, IPLCs, uh, indigenous people in local communities, and understand that sometimes they are not prepared, like they they, they don't have um, judicial structure. They they don't have like a institution, but they are doing the groundwork, and and is our like role working how we can make them access resources, resources that is necessary. We can create uh, more modern and accessible ways to help them with their resources. And sometimes it's not like just money in their hands, but like sometimes it's actually like giving them back their lands. <laughs> I was in an event last week and there was people talking about regeneration. A lot of very rich people in a land that was indigenous land for like over a thousand years, but they buy everything and they are talking about a regeneration here. And I asked to them, are you willing to giving them back to their lands? <laughs> Silence, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like we need, we need to make room. I think what my, my main solution is, who is the people that can hold space for the hard conversations happening, like, and create some circles that we are working together, that we will working together until we get some solution. Uh, because we are like coming back to our rooms with the thoughts about the problem, but we are not bringing solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think this is what some of my thoughts around this. And I really think that the advertisement industry is a key to, to address, especially the individual's behavior. Thanks. And it is beyond the time for those hard conversations. But I also want to give some time for our audience here and our online audience for some questions before we close out the session. Please, Anne. Um, Anne Florini, Arizona State University and New America. I'd like to tie the discussion here back to our opening discussion because Bina asked what I thought was a really interesting question to the president on the connection between climate and democracy. And just as a little plug, there will be an event on climate and democracy in this room on November 7th to which you are all invited. But I'm, I wanted to tie it particularly, Madame Mir, to your point about where's the money and why is it not coming. But of course, right now, there's tens of billions of dollars coming out of the federal government 40% of which is supposed to go to the environmentally frontline communities um, under the Justice 40 initiative, which is a result of extremely effective political organizing by people from those communities over the last several years. In the United States, is there any evidence that that is 
potentially the beginnings of support to the communities that will both at the same time give them the resources that they need but also provide a focal point around which you can get rejuvenation of local democracy itself. And for the other panelists, is there any evidence that the climate crisis can have positive impacts on bottom-up democracy because it's forcing people to come together around a crisis? Or do we have democracy decay and the climate crisis reinforcing each other in a negative direction? So to answer your first question, yes. Uh, the Justice 40 and funding that came from, uh, from IRA, from the um, act that really allowed a lot of funding to go in these communities is absolutely having a tremendous impact already, even though it had been, um, and, and we're still experiencing challenges just to make sure that funding is getting out to community and it's getting out to the right people. We certainly understand that the um, significant weight of EPA and DOE and the Department of Transportation and just the process of trying to do that has been extraordinary and I have to applaud them on the efforts that they've gotten. But we're just coming back from uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, the HBCU Climate Change Consortium with over 400 people from government agencies and nonprofits and, uh, and students alike where these are groups that are also benefiting from an EPA Thrive Grant. And this is how communities are coming together and having these conversations and bringing in people from all over the country to talk about the solutions. That's happening in part because of uh, additional funding that's coming through Justice 40. And, and uh, we just left, and I saw a, a whole station from NASA that was set up here, uh, again, in this space that was directly addressing and having these conversations with students on a level that we've never thought of before. So that first answer is yes, and we should all be empowered by that. The same time, we have to be very concerned because it is under attack. Right now, we have a representative, Representative Scalise, who is one of the people who is up for Speaker of the House that's coming from a constituency based in Louisiana that is facing extreme environmental challenges. There's salt water going up the Mississippi River. We just talked about that. And, and so the idea that we could be in a position with a federal government that is already um, Right now, uh, an administration that is doing their darnest to be able to uh, live up to the commitment of, of environmental justice, as they stated when they began, uh, that's also fighting with uh, a, a legislative body that doesn't like regulation. So these communities need your help. They need your support. They need this advocacy. Um, passing IRA was not enough. You can't pass it and don't support the entities and the communities that need to continue to see it done. So, you know, I know there was a lot of celebration after we got that finished, but there were folks that were saying, okay, now we need everybody to get down on the ground with us and keep pushing and keep fighting so that we can continue to have a flow of funding and we can leverage it and we can talk about private investment and we can begin really having, I think, more a global impact. That's the next level and next space where we are now. We have a, a very large question uh, from our global uh, online audience, which is that more and more the world seems to be retreating back into camps or zones of influence, which can only make global efforts to tackle problems like the climate crisis more difficult. Is there any way to reverse this trend, or do we have to figure out ways to work within this new system of essentially great power competition? I, I think that there's certainly, I mean, there is local resistance, uh, you know, there's agency, there's solidarity, but it is David and Goliath, and I think that that big cruise ship or yacht does need to come to the fore, and I think in, in the geo uh, strategic space, what needs to happen, and we've been trying to push this through different think tanks, you know, the idea of China and the US, for instance, right? So I mean, th there was a time in the Nixonian era where uh, you, you know that rapprochement happened through Pakistan. It, it, you know, it's it's a roller coaster relationship. I'm, I'm uh, you know I'm aware of that as well. But there are possibilities in these you know countries to try and green CPAC, mm -hmm. for instance, right? For the US, and that would be the interesting possibilities there. Uh, I, I think now with the new uh, COP, I mean, Saudi is trying to, you know, has been in discussion with Pakistan to set up a $10 billion oil refinery, 
right? So I mean, this set, you know, while it's trying to transition itself, you know, there is this fear that a lot of this obsolete, you know, uh, technology gets shipped off elsewhere. So I think those are kind of the, the concerns and also the opportunities where, I mean, you know, and, and the possibility to leapfrog. I mean, if that can happen, but I mean, of course, it needs, uh, you know, it needs resource commitment and it needs a, a less um, acrimonious uh, engagement for which there are also vested interests. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have one more question from our audience and then I think we'll have to close out the session. Um, hi, I'm Emily. I was uh -oh. one of <laughs> Saeed Mohammed's um, previous students um, at American University. <laughs> So my question is about um, activist movements um, like related to debt for climate um, exchanges from places like the World Bank and IMF. Um, there are a lot of people from the Global South that are calling um, for these larger international um, financing organizations to exchange or relieve debt um, because of the environmental degradation they have caused. So you kind of touched on this with um, the case of Guyana and um, they're sort of like because of their debt, they're opening up more land for extraction from Exxon. Um, you see this with industrial agriculture in Costa Rica and different parts of the world all over. And so uh, I guess for all of the panelists, um, when it comes to financing a just transition, how do you see these kinds of debt cancellation um, actions? And that would be the most beneficial uh, way, way to go about it. Uh, I think you have to look at a um, a, a, a body of financing. There's not going to be one particular avenue. And certainly as um, in, in, I think with, we have to look at this with, it, with the eyes of, of a financing perspective, um, because while there's relieving debt, there's also making a profit. And so with every debt that's relieved, that's either coming off of someone's books or it is now giving an opportunity to create profit. So really profit is the end game, not just the debt relief. And when we think about that profit side of it and who is getting the profit and why and what is the purpose of it, is it really driving us to a space where again, we're getting into a fossil fuel economy and we're moving into uh, a transition of renewable energy. I think that has to be a part of this debt relief conversation. For some countries and for some spaces, absolutely, because the debt relief allows them an opportunity to invest in some of the renewable options that they really are seeking to do. But in some spaces, yes, there's definitely a conflict. If um, the debt relief is associated with Exxon taking and getting rid of its old oil refinery stuff and then giving it to a space in a, uh, a, a country or an opportunity to not, ref not update it or upgrade it, then we have a bigger problem than what we started with in the first space. So I just think that there's a bit more to that question that doesn't only rely in relieving debt but must be married to the point of getting the profit and profit into communities that, that have historically needed it, but also are really looking to drive a renewable uh, economy for themselves. So debt relief in the sense of multilateral mm -hmm. debt, which would be, you know, I mean, it would be a tough sell for, for the um, lenders, but the possibility of climate debt debt swaps, mm -hmm. right? So, so channeling that relief, I mean, not so a minister can buy a Rolex, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, for, for, for useful stuff and they all these historical reasons for it and social justice reasons for it, um, uh, but yeah. I know I said last question, but I see that President Sirleaf has a question, so uh, I wanna give. Thank you. I don't really have a question, but I wanna make a statement and maybe that might inspire others to respond to that. Uh, everyone knows that biodiversity is concentrated in the global south, mm -hmm. mainly in the form of forests, large forests. Forests have been used as a source of livelihood for communities. There have been a movement of trying to make sure that the preservation of forests are maintained uh, in response to give some support for community development. Most times, very primary support that will not do any 
transformation of those communities into self-independent, self-sufficient communities. Um, we also have a question of uh, many of our countries that rely on fossil fuel. That's how they create the domestic revenue to finance their own social goods, to finance governance. And there's a lot of pressure now coming uh, from partners that says, we're going to cut off assistance unless you stop producing fossil fuels. Uh, the reliance then is on, well, we're going to get through, through uh, the COP arrangements. There's going to be a flow. And we know that there have been so many meetings with the COPs and the uh, commitment to provide this level of financing to enable countries just has not come. The money has not come. And when it comes to forests, there's not a big, it's like the gold rush now, carbon credits. Uh, all the capitalists, are, we're going to do carbon credits. And that's where we're going to enable you to get, well, carbon credits is not well known by the communities where the forests are. Hardly known, too, by the governments. This is something new. And so that's going to be another area that's going to lead uh, uh, to corruption, to deals, and to all those types of things. So maybe now we may have to, some of our countries in the global south, decide that if the money isn't coming, we're going to be very clear about barter arrangements. We'll go back to the old days. You know, if you want me to stop uh, doing fossil fuels, then give me a hydroelectric plant, mm -hmm. or give me a solar plant. Give me something that I know is, is substantive, is going to lead to financing things that will improve the lives of people. So climate change, climate change is real, and the effects of it on, our, on many of our countries are very devastating. Unless we find a means to respond to those by providing a means whereby they can have this transformation to the means of getting the energy that they leave for the development, uh, then we'll be talking about this and not really being able to, to get the effects of making a, a world that's greener, a world that's better. So I, I know that we are over time, but um, you know, if anybody wants to have a very quick one sentence reaction um, to that, but. Um, and then we can move from there. Yes, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. All right, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you. To our audience. Um, this has been a wonderful event. I want to thank you, Madam President, for joining us. Thank our panelists. And um, stay tuned. Conversation's still going on, and you're invited. Thank you. <laughs>